official start. So um, ignore ignore what I've been babbling on a bit before. So welcome everyone to um, Pandemic Intimacies. Um, thanks for your interest and thanks so much for uh, joining us. We're really pleased to see so many people here. I'm not counting, but there are quite a lot of you here. Um, I'm Ingrid Young. I'm based at the University of Edinburgh. Um, and I'm going to be chairing this panel. I usually have a lot to say, but because I'm chairing, I won't be talking a lot. I'm sure some of you will be happy to know. Um, I'm co-investigator on the ESRC project, Digital Intimacies, and that's the project that's organized this webinar. Um, and I'm working with Jamie Hackham. I don't know if there are so many faces, but Jamie, if you want to wave. Um, Jamie is based at the University of East Anglia and he's the lead, he's the principal investigator on the project. And James Cummings, who's also recently joined us as a senior research associate. James, do you want to give a wave um, in the... Um, so the project Digital Intimacies is an interdisciplinary study. Uh, it brings together media and cultural studies, sociology and public health. And we're working with a number of community partners in England and Scotland. And I see some of them on the call, which is great. Um, broadly, the project aims to situate smartphone mediated intimacies uh, more fully in their social and cultural contexts. And we can talk lots about the project if you'd like, but actually given the current context, we thought it was really important to reflect on how the current pandemic is um, affecting gay men's cultures of intimacy specifically. We have a really great group of speakers um, who will talk to us for about five to seven minutes and we've, we've drawn on uh, colleagues and friends um, from d different sec sectors. Um, I will stop them talking after about seven minutes. Um, uh, although I've given them more power than I was originally intending to, so they might continue talking. Um, we and what I'll do is I will tell you who the speakers are, and then I'll go through some of the housekeeping, um, the housekeeping bits and pieces. Our first speaker is Jamie Hackham, who is a lecturer in media studies at the University of East Anglia, uh, and who I've mentioned already is the lead on uh, digital intimacies, our project. Our next speaker is Mark Thompson. He's an activist in social in so for social justice around sexual health, HIV, and for queer communities of color, and is director of Love Tank, co-founder of Prepster, and co-founder of Blackout UK. Joao Florencio, apologies for pronunciations uh, to you and to other people, I make a hash of your name. Uh, Joao is a senior lecturer in the history of modern and contemporary art and visual culture at the University of Exeter and is currently working on an AHSC um, leadership fellowship called Masculinity and the Ethics of Porosity in Post-AIDS Gay Porn. Christian Muller is a postdoctoral researcher at the IT University in Copenhagen and is currently working on a project called Intimate Media, Medicalized Sex, Using HIV Preventing Medicine and Recreational Drugs. John Mercer, Professor of Gender and Sexuality in the School of Media at Birmingham City. John, I'm apologizing, I didn't have a project I could describe, I, I could find, um, but John's interests are in film, television, pornography, and the sexualization of contemporary media culture. Charlie Witzel is a social scientist at Stigma Research at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and Charlie works in HIV, sexual health, uh, amongst LGBT communities, most recently on selfie, uh, self-testing public health intervention. Okay, that's probably the most talking I'm going to do. I'll let the speakers speak for themselves, but just a few housekeeping things. Um, we have started recording this. I hope that's all right with everyone. Bear in mind that it is being recorded and we will post it on our, on our Digital Intimacies website uh, once this is finished. Um, so don't say anything you don't want shared publicly. Um, we'll start with the speakers that I've just run through. I'll let them run through their talks um, in the order I've mentioned, and then we'll let the panel have about 10 to 15 minutes discussion between themselves, I think, so they can engage with each other a little bit more rather than just listen to each other. But we will open it up, uh, up to questions and comments and discussion at that point. You are all on mute. 
um, and you do not have the power to unmute yourself. You have to ask us to unmute you. So if you send myself or James Cummings a message, we can unmute you and you can either, you can speak or you can give your comments or you can write a question in the comments box. It's entirely up to you. Or you can just sit and listen um, to us talk. Um, I think that is everything. If there are no kind of questions or concerns, I'm gonna hand over to our first speaker, Jamie Hackham, and I'll just let the speakers go one after the other rather than introducing you, if, if that's all right. But I can remind you of the order if you have forgotten. So I'm gonna hand over to Jamie. Thank you, Ingrid. Um, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jamie Hakim. I'm the principal invest investigator on the project that's hosting this event. It's really wonderful to see so many people here and to be sharing the uh, panel with such esteemed speakers. Um, okay, so um, I'd like to start this roundtable um, by speaking to an issue that I've begun to notice in relation to gay male intimacy in the time of coronavirus. So first is the advice given to gay men not to hook up during lockdown. And second of all, the moralizing that has taken place across social media as a result. I view these as problems, albeit perhaps unresolvable ones. And in these opening remarks, uh, I'd like to explain why. So perhaps the best way into this is to outline the understanding of intimacy that the project is using. Currently, um, we're drawing on the work of Lauren Ballant and Michael Warner to understand gay male cultures of intimacy. In their work, they depart from the mainstream conception of intimacy as the innermost thoughts and feelings shared between long-term partners in the domestic, familial, or private sphere. Instead, Berlant defines intimacy as the connections we depend on for living. So this is an attempt to describe the variety of non-heteronormative intimacies practiced by queer folk, as well as the stakes involved in them. With Michael Warner, Berlan also points out that these queer intimacies are not confined to the private sphere, but are in fact very much produced in public space, in gay neighborhoods, bookshops, community centers, clubs and bars, sex on premises venues and cruising grounds. These queer counterpublics, as they call it, have been in spaces in which the connections that queer people depend on for living are made. These are not only spaces of sexual pleasure, crucial to living though that is, they're also spaces where, in their words, a public world of belonging and transformation is elaborated. Bookshops where intimate cultures are learnt about and spaces where queer people can just exist at all. So how has this understanding of intimacy been useful for making sense of gay men's cultures of intimacy during the pandemic? Well, the response by the UK government to the pandemic has been to eventually impose a lockdown and enforce social distancing. And what this has amounted to is an almost absolute retraction of society into the private sphere, if only temporarily. In response to these conditions, some gay sexual health organisations have been advocating that gay men completely abstain from hooking up with anyone from outside their household. And at the same time, gay men have taken to social media to admonish other gay men who have not managed to do so. Given Berlant and Warner's insights into the constitutive publicness of gay male cultures of intimacy, this retraction to the private sphere and its policing has particular implications that require some thinking through. So for gay men, even in the age of gay marriage, the household is not always, or at least not the only, organizational unit of our cultures of intimacy. As I've just said, gay men have long relied on an elaborate network of publicly accessible spaces to engage in different intimate practices, many of which, except cruising grounds, are currently closed. And given the economic crisis precipitated by the pandemic, may not be in the financial shape to open again once social distancing is lifted. Of course, gay men have been using their smart devices to digitally mediate their intimate lives during social distancing. And indeed, this has been encouraged by some gay men's sexual health organizations to replace physical intimacy. And again, I don't just mean sex here, but also, for example, therapy sessions where intimate problems are discussed. However, the digital mediation of intimacy only gets you so far. 
although discussions about digital media during the pandemic have tended to be reduced to a zero-sum game of digital media has saved us during lockdown versus digital media can never replace authentic intimacy. In most people's pre-pandemic lives, digital and physical intimacies were entangled in intricate ways. We couldn't live without either. And yet at the moment, we're having to live without one. Unsurprisingly then, not all gay men have followed the advice to abstain from sex with someone from outside their household. Anecdotally, some gay men are still hooking up, whether that be in other people's homes or on cruising grounds, and some, men, some other gay men are judging them for it. To be absolutely clear, I'm not making an argument against lockdowns and social distancing during this particular moment of the pandemic. What I'm urging, however, is an intersectional consideration of the reasons that make certain forms of privatized intimacy more practicable for some people than it does for others, and why some gay and bisexual men might be breaking lockdown despite the personal risk it poses for them and the spread of coronavirus in the wider population. As Lauren Ballant and Michael Warner have so persuasively argued, what is commonly called casual sex is often not casual at all. It constitutes one element of an assemblage of different intimate connections that gay and bisexual men rely on for living and that have structurally depended on the sort of counter public spaces that have necessarily had to close in these pandemic times and many of which may never open again afterwards. Class, race and generation are also key here given not only how the pandemic has dramatically intensified existing inequalities uh, often with deathly results, but also how these inequalities play out in relation to both the private spaces and digital counterpublics that gay men are being encouraged to use, but have differential access to and experiences of. I would argue that cognizance of all this is essential to any discussion of gay male intimacy in the time of coronavirus, especially for organisations advocating for abstinence and for the gay men taking to social media to moralise against other gay men who have failed to practice it. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie. So it's over to me. Thank you. So I'm Mark Thompson. As Ingrid said, I'm the co-founder of Prepster.info and um, the Love Tank and various other things. So hopefully this will work. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the work that we have done at Prepster during COVID-19. Um, we went into lockdown as an organization the same day as everybody else and we got together straight away and thought okay so what can we do so um, just a bit of background for those of you that may not know who Prepster are we've been running for just coming up to five years now we're a small community-based organization in uh, based in London but have a global reach our aim is to educate and agitate for prep access across the UK and abroad uh, we're sex positive, we're grassroots, and we're collaborative. We absolutely believe in partnership and good collaborative working. And in some of the um, activity I'm going to talk to you about today that will demonstrate that. We believe in smart activism, so we're not just shouting. Uh, we believe in engaging with community, government, and our funders at a real and robust level. Um, what do we do? Well, we provide top level prep information and by that the information is accessible, easy to read and is written with our users in mind. We try to ensure that um, any information we have has um, people who access prep or have sexual health issues that it speaks directly to them. We are engaged in outreach and advocacy. Most of it has been digital, but we have started to move. We had started to move into um, the real world as well. We provide free training development materials. Um, so anything that we produce is accessible and available for people to use um, wherever they need to. And we have a peer-to-peer -peer education model which has been demonstrated through our work for women in our Mob Press program and our work for queer men of color. And all of our work um, is evidence-based and we are engaged in both um, academic and community-based research. So uh, you can follow us at, um, at Team Prepster on all of these spaces. And as this is about digital work, a lot of the stuff I'm going to be talking about today is around our online activity. So when we went down into lockdown on the 20th of March, <coughs> excuse me, 
um, we as a team got together and we were just about to start doing lots of our regular prep work which was around letting people know in the community how they can access prep how they can use it how they can buy it safely and we decided really quickly that we wanted to ensure that the communities we were working with had up-to-date and relevant information around COVID so we created the COVID hub which has around 28 different pieces of information, everything ranging from stopping and starting prep to, to information for older people, right through to stuff around pregnancy um, and being in a safe space. So as you can see here from these, these images here, we had lots of it, stuff coming through to us about, because prep is our, is our mainstay, we had lots of people asking questions and contacting us around stopping and starting prep because we realized really early on that many people going into lockdown were aspiring certainly straight away not to have sex. Um, so we're starting prep. So we want to make sure that information was there. But then as time went on, we recognized as, as Jamie has pointed out that people were still gonna be having sex. And we at Preps, as I've said, we take a real sex positive approach and also a harm reduction. So whereas some of our colleagues in other organizations and other bodies we're having a really strong um, abstinence stance. We didn't think that was the best way forward. We've always come from the point of harm reduction and giving people the information to make the decisions that they wanted to. So we knew that anecdotally, straight away, that men were going onto apps and were hooking up um, and having sex. So we wanted to find ways to provide alternatives. All of the information that we put out um, on the site definitely had the uh, government line and the government guidance about staying home and not hooking up, but we couched it in however we know that you might be. And again, within the information, we not only spoke about hooking up, but we tried to provide information to guys um, about what they should do if they did hook up. So what um, uh, hygiene measures might they need to take, um, et cetera. We also felt it was really important to support that work around issues around mental health, stuff for sex workers. Um, so that was content which was also created on the site. Just following on from what Jamie said in his presentation, we came in for a lot of knockback from members of the community um, questioning us and saying that we were endorsing um, people going out and hooking up. And we were able to push back and just say again, you know, that we're about providing information for people to make informed choices. Again, this information is now being picked up and has been replicated in Australia. It's been adapted into several languages around the world. So again, we are open to people using this because we saw, and I think colleagues saw that we couldn't tell guys not to do this, but we needed to make sure they got the information. So moving on, we recognized, obviously, as it has been mentioned before, that COVID was hitting um, black and Asian and other ethnic minority communities. And our work is really strong and focused around reaching the needs of queer men of color. So we partnered with um, a small body very similar to Prepster in New York called Heads or Tails. And I came across a comic series that they had done called Sex and the Coronavirus. And we partnered with them to adapt the stories uh, for a London audience. Um, so therefore the language and the graphics were slightly changed and altered so that somebody who's in Brixton or in Hackney uh, could, could relate to them. So we um, initially commissioned three stories which introduced uh, three, sorry, four different characters negotiating sex and intimacy, accessing prep um, throughout COVID and you can just see uh, a sample of them here. So again, they were highly visual, they were targeting younger queer men of colour, specifically African and African Caribbean men, and we looked at everything from social isolation, to hooking up, to starting prep, to um, being locked down with your partner for too long, um, to just dealing with being able to talk through the issues that might be coming up for people. And this, I have to say, has been the most popular posts that we have ever put out. We've had over three to 400 people engaging, well, just liking it on Insta alone. And I don't know what that means, but the kids tell me that that means it's been really successful. We've got three more coming out next week, so please look out for those. And then finally, um, just want to turn your attention to this, that we worked in partnership with Grindr because Grindr recognized that there were lots of men who were still coming onto the site 
um, and they approached uh, Prepster to host, to, to just see what we could do around making sure that messages were getting out there. And initially what Grindr had done was to boost a lot of the COVID-19 information that we were doing. So I'm not sure if any of you know, but Grindr have not traditionally been great at promoting sexual health information and sexual health promoters or health promoters that go on there are very often kicked off of the site. So we were really fortunate that they invited us in and they were boosting a lot of the COVID messages that we were putting out onto the site. So people were seeing those globally. And then they invited us to curate a um, Insta Live event which happened last week Thursday which I hosted which had these five amazing activists from around the world talking around what was happening in their regions how they were managing COVID what they were doing around men who might be hooking up online or in the real world so again that was a really really useful conversation to look at how they were responding um, and again there was a lot of local um, and regional engagement on the insta live as we did that so it's been a challenging time for us it's been interesting but we've kind of stuck to our guns of making sure that the information gets out to people that need it and that's me Thanks. Uh, thank you, Mark. So I guess I'm going. Um, yes, yeah, so I'll just have some thoughts to to read um, some kind of reflections on on the last few months. So after after the COVID after the outbreak of COVID nineteen was first identified in Wuhan in December last year, and the disease declared a pandemic by the WHO on the eleventh of March governments around the world proceeded to put in place a series of containment measures that tended to involve a closing of borders and differing forms of physical distancing amongst its citizens under designations such as self-isolation, quarantine or lockdown. There are various formats notwithstanding. Physical distancing measures ask that people stay in their households, avoiding contact with others as much as possible. Only through staying away from one another, that is only by staying away from those who are not part of our house households, could the pandemic be contained and the now popular R0 number be reduced to a value below one. At the same time, within the framework of a state of emergency, some governments also implemented measures aimed at strengthening the powers of the state over its citizens ranging from the Hungarian parliament's vote to have President Viktor Orban ruling by decree to the broadening of powers given to police forces to surveil and control populations. Such a move towards what could normally be seen as authoritarianism isn't surprising, especially considering the histories of past pandemics such as polio and how it was eradicated much earlier in, Cu in Cuba and other countries of the Eastern and countries of the Eastern Bloc during the Cold War years. Authoritarian regimes, history appears to tell us, have historically fared better in containing epidemics. Eventually, as the number of new cases started to drop, countries began lifting some of the, the restrictions placed on the lives of their citizens, with some governments allowing members of two different households to meet indoors, and in places like the UK introducing so-called support bubbles, whereby um, members of a single adult household were allowed to start visiting another household and even spend the night together. Importantly though, as the new UK guidelines stated, one was only allowed to form a support bubble once and only with one other a household. And that support bubble could not be changed. Just like marriage, uh, just like marriage a support bubble appeared to be monogamous and for life or at least for the life of the pandemic. Yet, uh, while all these and other measures, such as the mandatory use of face masks and the avoidance of physical contact, do, uh, whilst they do certainly help contain the spread of coronavirus, they have tended to neither take into account the social and cultural dimensions of all pandemics, nor the social and intimate realities of many people's lives the dimensions of our everyday that are to many equally as important when it comes to forge a life worth living. For a large number of gay men in particular, the demands placed upon us by the state and health authorities men, meant that the forms of, soci of sociability and sexual intimacy that constitute a fundamental part of our lives had not been recognized for the important role they play in our own well-being. 
Instead, they were ignored in calls to stay home or to only be allowed to visit one other person. In so doing, the official responses to the COVID-19 pandemic highlighted a long history of tension between community and immunity, whereby vertical relationships between citizens and the state are set up to protect citizens by replacing the threatening horizontal relationships amongst citizens themselves. As it's been well documented in the history of both political thought and uh, immunology, intimate community relations risk killing people by bringing them together. And so modern nation states have developed both the police and health authorities to Im immunize citizens against the threats of communal intimacy. Yet in so doing, they have tended to ignore the ways in which community confers meaning to people's lives, a phenomenon that is strongest amongst populations that may exist on the edges, uh, on the edges of or besides state membership and citizenship. So I'm thinking here about migrants, uh, black indigenous people of color and queers. In Berlin, where I have been staying throughout the pandemic, that tension has become evident to me in two ways. First, over the last few months, stories have emerged of a fossey of uh, infection in predominantly Turkish neighborhoods, where households tend to be larger and where cultural background and ongoing racism have historically led people to build closer ties with their neighbors, forging systems of cultural and emotional support otherwise unavailable to them. Second, ever since the pandemic started, I witnessed the development of risk management strategies amongst gay men around me, and myself included. Those often involved, beyond trying to abide by physical distancing guidelines, choosing a limited number of regular uh, corona fuck buddies, even if that went against the detail of official regulations. Similarly, uh, I have seen gay men who have developed symptoms of what could be COVID-19 contacting the men they had had sex with, sex with to notify them. Whilst falling uh, outside government guidelines, whilst ignored by them, grassroots practices of care such as those were, uh, such as those were led by a need to balance an ethical imperative with the realization that spending several months alone in an apartment was untenable to many of us. Hindering uh, our own well-being, our own sense of self and the survival of our own culture. The importance of such practices to the cultural survival, survival of minority groups should therefore not be underestimated. Measures need to be put in place in order to best cater to our needs and, and certainly what Prepster have been doing is really um, at the forefront of that, I think. Um, devising and communicating reasonable risk management and harm reduction strategies that take into account the ways in which our lives, if worth living, should not simply be reduced to the survival of our individual bodies and that mental health, sociability, intimacy and community relations are equally fundamental to the collective lives we should strive to forge and maintain. If that doesn't happen, and considering that COVID-19 is far from being over, we risk a generalized sense of pandemic fatigue, which is already being associated with new recent spikes in the number of cases seen in Australia, the UK, Portugal, Germany, and other countries. Evidenced as well by the emergence of so-called corona raves in Manchester and Berlin, and in Berlin, a lot of, of also um, kind of orgies in parks at night um, amongst gay men primarily. So those should serve as a stark reminder of the pool of community and of the ways in which immunological orthodoxy will never be able to contain the allure of the social, the intimate and the communal. A more capacious approach to COVID-19 public health advice is therefore urgently needed. So that's my thinking on the matter. Awesome. Uh, I think I am the one to take over here. So I'll just see if I can share my, my screen. There we go. Okay, uh, my, let's see how I handle my five to seven, seven minutes. Um, so yeah, I'll be talking about platformed intimacy and, and the meeting of, 
what we can call drug intimacies, uh, which I've been studying and I am studying. So to start out, to make an obvious point, um, pandemic intimacy depends on digital media to a large extent. Um, and those intimate publics or scenes that we can talk about, um, that those that are already deeply mediated that existed before the pandemic, well, they are well positioned to keep their intimate practices intact. And so we could focus on one issue of, uh, of uh, adapting to mediated forms of intimacy and that, that adaptation requires work. Um, and it requires that the practice and the physical engagement um, changes according to what the media infrastructure allows for or offers. I think we can all remember when those uh, Zoom parties hang out with our friends in the beginning were like super fun and then we realized we can't just like adapt, go, go in with the same expectations because it is in some ways quite a, a laborious <laughs> thing to do uh, as is uh, so many other things on, on Zoom. Um, so some adaptation is needed. So learning from critical drug studies, we may say that uh, what our bodies are able to feel and do is something that we may experiment with and enhance, right? It isn't stable, we can change it in different ways. Um, so the body is always already technical uh, and uh, or somatechnical. Um, so my not so obvious argument, or maybe it is, but I don't think it is, um, is that drug using mediated intimate encounters uh, or scenes that experiment with how chemical inventions, interventions can change our bodily capacities they are better attuned to the specific opportunities of mediated encounters that are forced upon us in this very moment, which is what I've been studying, uh, the digital engagements with sexualized drug use, angered in counter publics of quote unquote transgressive practice. And I've been doing that, I've been looking at different media sites. Uh, let's see if I can change it. First sites, well, I've been looking at Pornhub and I've been looking at video conferencing sites like Zoom. And let me start with Pornhub. Pornhub. Um, drawing together a, 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 a quite large um, material uh, on what we, call, we could call chemsex porn. Uh, there is a rich archive of chemsex porn or porn that in some ways relate to drug uh, uh, sensuality uh, online. Um, there are uh, they are subject to really rich social engagements, well, relatively, um, within the comments section. So many people really like, really engaged in what happens in, in, in these videos. Um, and as are so many, uh, at the point from so many online engagements, there are really some key active users creating playlists and commenting on each other, propping each other up. Um, and really creating the material and infrastructure for um, drug pleasures to to in, emerge uh, in these uh, around these videos, and we sh we should of course also think about uh, these videos not only as uh, you know representations but also as objects that circulate in you know classical chemsex practices of you know you meet up with a bunch of guys you watch porn together to get in the mood and so on and so forth. So that's that's also an important uh, element to it. Um, yeah, and then the second element, uh, the second service I was looking at are video conferencing services like Zoom, uh, where, I, where I found that there were like, well, as many people might know, that there are these quite well-hidden hangouts uh, of, that can go up to 100 people at a time, where people, or maybe more sometimes, um, where people uh, in deeply social ways hang out for many hours at a time, um, um, engaging in more or less erotic uh, um, exchanges and, and um, doing crystal meth or DHB um, along the way. So it ranges from small impromptu gatherings to really bigger organized recurring events that kind of like lend, that, that use uh, visual uh, clues from, from clubbing uh, scenes, um, yeah, from gay clubbing scenes. And what I found was that both sex, you know, jerking off, having sex, but also 
just the act of smoking, lighting up uh, your pipe or injecting were both key erotic elements in the scene, which of course makes it clear that that sexuality is <laughs> does not always only attach to the body, but also you know um, attaches to other objects um, around us. Um, so what we can say here is that we have this long tail intimacy culture, right? During the pandemic, we really need to think about um, who are the lead leaders of these uh, intimacy cultures and who, like, how do you engage? On what levels do you engage? It is a polymedial. Uh, practice. It depends on, like, for example, Zoom, how did you get here? You know, you, you need other ways to inform people that this is actually happening. And so we have this very polymedial experience that is always displaced because of this uh, quite static negative media environment that we're finding ourselves in. What some people are calling um, the deplatformization de de of sex. We've seen it with Tumblr closing down. We've seen it with the a, a, a female presenting nibble attack uh, on Facebook and so on. And what we get is a, that we have this sex negative social media environment. Um, and that's what we came into the pandemic with. And this is what made contemporary mainstream intimacy less resilient than it could be, I would argue. And so that's why it makes sense to look at these transgressive sexual cultures, right? Because they have been operating and trying to like move their ways around these, these, uh, these roadblocks. And finally, I don't wanna neglect the questions of safety and care that such an, an intimacy culture uh, brings about because of course, we, as we, we are well aware, uh, there's obvious risks of viral transmission that if you stick to the, the digital encounter, are of course, uh, totally removed. Um, but of course, other risks uh, emerge in terms of using drugs alone, you might not have the, the same kind of support networks that you did when you did it at the club or when you did it over uh, at your friend's house. Um, so those are some, some concerns I would like to, to share right at the ending. Thank you. Okay, I, th I think I'm next. So I am John Mercer and I'm a PI on an AHRC network called Masculinity, Sex and Popular Culture that I run with Clarissa Smith and Joao and Jamie are both network steering group members. At the moment, I'm developing a project about gay midlife. Um, it's in its very early stages, and that's really kind of framing my thinking at the moment. So I think what I'm going to do is probably mostly just add traction to what's already been said. So I'm going to try and talk really briefly about three things that are uppermost in my mind at the moment. And my comments are particularly about a, a UK context for the most part. So firstly, um, I've got a, a, a set of thinking about gay male experience and, and, and that gay male experience is something that might matter. And secondly, I've got something to say about 21st, attitude, uh, 21st century attitudes towards sex and sexuality in the UK. And finally, I've got something to say about messaging. So it was really interesting to hear Mark talking about uh, how important messaging was earlier on. So I'm going to talk about gay male experience to begin with. Um, so last week, I was listening to Evan Davis on Radio 4, as I often do while I'm making my tea. Um, and he had a, a segment where members of the public were asking questions about COVID-19 infection risk, primarily through contact with friends and family due to the, uh, the loosening of the lockdown. So they're asking questions about whether I might see this person, if I, and if I see this person, am I coming into contact with everybody else they might know too? And it really took me straight back to the 1980s. It really started me thinking yet again about how it felt to be gay in the 1980s. There's a sense in which um, in popular conversation, it's become more and more the case that people are talking about this idea that AIDS in the 80s might have been preparation for COVID-19 and that gay men might have learned how to live in a pandemic. And I think there is something to say there. Um, the fear of contagion became part of gay men's life. The, the constant reminder of death, the very insidious nature of the connection between 
intimacy, contagion and illness. The idea that gay men carry the burden of responsible behaviours and are simultaneously cast as on the one hand victims and on the, on the other hand um, to blame for their behaviours. And I really think that gay men can offer a lot now in terms of thinking how to live in a pandemic, especially those who've lived through that moment. Um, this is going to necessitate a move away from the kind of um, the undercurrent of ageism that I think has become, in, in my view, one of the more uh, prominent aspect, uh, aspects of, of culture at the moment. I don't see any evidence that anybody is listening to gay men at the moment, though. Um, the second point I want to make is around attitudes towards sex and sexuality. So the height of the AIDS crisis was the mid 1980s, so nearly 40 years ago now. So I think you probably expect that the social and cultural landscape has changed ever such a lot since then. It seems to me at least in the present moment that sex and shame are still so tethered to each other in the UK that it feels that uh, whilst everything has changed, nothing has changed at the same time. I think the UK context really demonstrates a perennial queasiness around sex. And even if we want to imagine that the 21st century is about paradigm shifts, we've definitely seen that social attitudes towards sex in the UK remain, at some level at least, entirely unchanged. So sex is framed as a private activity that we'd rather not talk about and certainly won't acknowledge in official or public settings. Mm. Sex is an activity that is embarrassing at best in the UK and at worst it's corrupting. Um, public health messaging has been particularly interesting in as much as responsible sex has been positioned as heteronormative monogamous activity by Public Health England which is something that Joao was referring to earlier on, and other types of domestic and sexual relations have effectively been made illegal at the stroke of a pen with no comment, no critique, no mention at all. But in a very British way, I think, they've been made technically and practically illegal, though not overtly so. So I think in terms of sex and sexuality, for me at least, the pandemic demonstrates that we need not or should not be complacent and not think that battles about sexuality are already won, or indeed that attitudes in the UK are profoundly changed. They are not, I don't think. So finally, I want to move on to messaging. What do we want groups who advocate for our community to do? Do we want them to advocate for abstinence as if it was a moral obligation and fun? This seems to be a, a position that the Terence Higgins Trust seems to have taken through their No Hookups campaign. They admit themselves that this is um, both extraordinary and kind of inevitable. Um, I don't think it's inevitable. I don't think it's the kind of response to the pandemic that I would have hoped for. But what kind of response is the right kind of response? And I think that's less clear. I think we need to ask questions about the drivers for this kind of position and this kind of messaging. So who benefits from this unquestioning acceptance of government policy via PHE? Do we want to see COVID-19 as an opportunity to ramp up HIV testing, even when walk-in sexual health services are closed across the country? So it's hard to access support for those people who might find themselves exposed. That's what Dean Street seems to be saying at the moment. And Terence Higgins Trust also seems to be supporting that position. Again, we need to ask questions about how well served we're being by these advocacy groups, these charities. It's not an attack on those people to be critical. These are exceptional times after all. So for me, it's really great to hear Mark talking about his work today. I think Prepster is really offering a sex positive approach. There is a model that we might hope should be taken up as a model for now and for future pandemics. I think we need not just meaningful messaging, but messaging matters. And that's as much as I want to say. 
All right, <clears throat> I think it is my turn now. Can everybody hear me? Can you put your hand up if you can hear me? Yeah, okay, great, thank you. Um, so my name is Charlie Witzel. I'm a research fellow at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And I have been doing some research with, uh, with a bunch of colleagues um, around, um, around sexual behavior and app use in the lockdown. So this has been a collaborative project with the University of Westminster, University of Brighton, Prepster, among some others. I, in, this, I, in this project, we've looked at sexual behavior, not just in uh, MSM, but also in gender diverse people who have sex with men. But for this, I'm just going to talk about our men who have sex with men, cis and trans, as it's the most relevant for the discussion that we're going to have today. Uh, so we're midway through this project. It's in two stages, so this will relate to the first stage. In the first stage, we recruited to an online survey. We, we recruited about 1,400 MSM, and we ran this between the 17th of April and the 3rd of May. So it was really during the sort of most intense lockdown period. We were really lucky that we were able to get this series of questions that we wanted to ask together really, really quickly, and were able to get very swift institutional um, ethical approval. So that was really great. The second stage, which would perhaps be more interesting to this audience, but it's not done yet, so I can't speak to it, is uh, a series of online uh, interviews within people from the original sample of 1400 uh, who filled in the survey, and we'll be looking more at their sexual behavior during lockdown. In any case, I think we have some uh, data which helps contextualize some of these discussions a little bit more. Um, in relation to, I think, I'll talk first about service access and then I'll move on to uh, casual sex after that. When the lockdown started, a lot of us were quite concerned that PrEP access was going to be a significant issue, not just because of clinical barriers, but potentially because medication supplies could be uh, interrupted. In the end, that didn't end up being the case. About two thirds of people who were on PrEP uh, when they filled in the survey did indeed interrupt their PrEP use during lockdown, largely because they weren't um, having any sex, but there were very, very few who weren't able to access PrEP at all. So if they wanted it, they could get it mostly. There, there were some issues with online orderings and a, and a couple of issues with clinics, but largely it continued on. Um, about 12% of people had been able to access uh, HIV and STI testing services. Um, and I think, that's, I think that amount has probably increased quite a lot now. There was a big drive, obviously, for people to get tested during lockdown. And this, this research period, I think, predates it by, by a little bit. When we look at uh, casual sex, I, for me, this is the most interesting part. There's been, as others have spoken about, this huge imperative, not, not just from, uh, from various bits of legislation that have come through, but also from public health messaging and a huge amount of pressure from uh, gay and bisexual men in online spaces to not hook up during COVID, not have casual sex, try and limit yourself. And that, that's really been a, like one of the primary pushes and something that if I'm honest, I didn't think I would necessarily see in my life. Um, we found that about three quarters of people did indeed stop having sex during lockdown, but a quarter continued to have casual sex uh, or indeed increase the amount of casual sex they were having over that period. So 75% of people at this stage had abstained, uh, whereas a quarter hadn't. And this was, as I said, pretty early in the lockdown period. There was also a very small minority, like I'm talking like 2%, who were engaging in more group sex than they were before during the lockdown period. And both of these aren't particularly surprising to me in that lots of people had more time on their hands, were also quite stressed out by the situation. Um, and this, this, is, this was an outlet for people. I think it's also interesting that there, we, we asked, uh, MSM, how long they thought that they could abstain from sex during this period if they were doing so. 
And 10% thought they could abstain for four weeks and another 30% thought that they could abstain for three months. So we've now pretty much passed the three months after lockdown period, which means that increasing numbers will be reinitiating sex if they haven't already, assuming that they were correct with the amount of time that they felt they could abstain. Of course, this was a perspective question. For me, that really complicates a whole bunch of stuff. The main one is this drive around breaking the chain of HIV transmission. I think this has been really, really pushed for lots of good reason, but I don't think that we've thought critically enough about what this means for individuals who didn't abstain, individuals who um, might have tried to abstain, but then didn't for a whole variety of reasons and what that means for them when they go and access services. I think it will be very difficult for them to have friends with or uh, discussions with their friends about their sexual behavior during lockdown, but even more so about going to, you know, to an STI clinic to try, to try and get a test saying that, yes, I've had risk over that period. And I feel like we don't, these, it, it seemed like a great opportunity, I think at the time to, to push this message about breaking the chain and came with a lot of um, with a lot of good intentions and thinking in a way that was you know probably quite pragmatic but it wasn't necessarily based on evidence in the way that it should have been and i think we then ended up having an issue where we're potentially really pathologizing individuals who couldn't. And I think that that's something that we need to be careful of as we move forward with our messaging beyond this. I think there were about four different surveys that I'm aware of that did research at the same time and strikingly all had very similar proportions of people who had indeed abstained. So I would, I would urge caution with that and, uh, and think about how we, how we develop our messaging so that it's more permissive for people to to talk about the difficulties that they've had with sexual behavior and with sex over lockdown. So I think that's me at time now. So thank you. Thank you, Charlie. And, and actually, thank you to everyone for um, the panel for such a, a wide ranging, but really thought provoking um, set of provocations, really, and, and reflections. Um, as I said at the start of this, and apologies to those of you who, who missed this introduction, um, we're, we're going to keep everyone on mute for now, or we're going to keep everyone on mute. Can I invite the panelists, the speakers, to um, maybe if you had any thoughts on the other other discussions, or if you had any questions for the other panelists, we've got. I'm going to allow for about ten minutes or so before we open it up to the group. But giving you the panelists, you have prerogative. Does does anyone want to start us off? Hey, Ingrid, I have a uh, question for Christian. <laughs> oh, go point. for it, yeah. yeah. Sure. Uh, Christian, thank you for that. Um, I'm wondering if you noticed anything, um, I'm not sure you're collecting data anymore, but I just wondered about the kind of uh, cult, these very kind of purely mediated cultures and had you noticed any changes um, during the pandemic? Um, and it, it makes me also think about the whole deplatforming de of sex and what that means in terms of people being able to conduct kind of intimate and sexual life over the internet when so many places have been, de well, sex has been deplatformed from so many places. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah thank you for, for that, Jamie. Um, you're right, I, I, I just got into collecting uh, data again. Maybe some of you recognize the feeling of like, oh, like, oh, I really should be doing research right now, but I'm just like too depressed, but like I'm getting there now. Um, but yes, so what I found, because like my data is from last year before the uh, pandemic. Um, and back then, if we start just by looking at Zoom, if, and, and the video conferencing, there's like Ring Central, there's Google Hangouts, all those like, yeah. Um, if you look at those scenes, um, they were really able to come together, well, the ones that I was looking at, uh, because uh, Google Plus was operating at the time. Um, and Google Plus, for those of you who don't know, is a social platform that tried to compete with Facebook. Google tried to compete with Facebook and failed miserably. So they had this uh, dying platforms lying around for, for, for years. 
Um, and what that meant in effect, what, what, I would, uh, what I see is that it was in effect, in effect an unmoderated or very poorly moderated platform at the time, uh, which was crucial because then these uh, groups of uh, chemsexes could actually find each other, share links to, uh, to video conferencing calls and actually engage with each other. Um, which would not be able to do on Facebook. Reddit, yes, it does also happens in there, but there is some more moderation uh, uh, in other ways happening there. So we need, that's my point about um, the sex negative culture, digital culture that we're in, because it was in fact, of course, closed down. And then it kind of just like dis disassembled. I am trouble, have trouble finding actually how people find each other now. So of course, people in the same local in London, knowing each other already, maybe through WhatsApp groups, are able to, to kind of configure something, but no, otherwise it is really, it, it has taken a whole different shape that it kind of pushed even more underground and made it even more uh, inaccessible. Yeah. I've got a question for Mark. Mark, can you uh, account for the difference in the, uh, the kinds of messaging strategy that you've adopted and the the uh, the, the um, Terence Higgins trust campaign. Um, well, you know, because there are children on the call, I'll, I'll mind the language. Um, I think it's. I mean, it's it's our starting point. Uh, as some people have put in the chat already, I mean, perhaps the love tank. We're relatively independent. We answer and march pretty much to our own drum. And as I said, our community is absolutely at the heart of what we do. And so we were realistic and we were authentic. And I think that was our strategy. And so when the, you know, don't hook up, which was then followed up by, you know, the have a wank kind of intervention. I mean, I kind of get the, 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 the place it was coming from, but we've always prided ourselves in being quite out there. And we knew that the community needed that information. I think we were also, I mean, I came off a call this morning and we were, we were, not surprised, but a little bit kind of perturbed by the, the knockback we got from some organizations and some community members. So we got the same shaming as everybody, but we were ready to push back because we had the evidence about why it was needed and that we knew that folk were, were hooking up. People were con and also people were messaging us directly with questions or with concerns, which they didn't feel they could go anywhere else. I just wanted to, to jump in as well when we were talking about, say, Zoom parties and, and, and things like that. That um, I know there are two points I want to make. Is that I know of one group, uh, a, a group of young black guys who had set up a sex club in London, which was meeting really, really frequently before lockdown. And they moved everything online and were producing once a month Zoom hookups, quarantine hookups, which proved to be really successful. But I think the other thing I want to kind of throw into the mix, which nobody's mentioned, is the, um, the rise of OnlyFans and the number of people who are engaging in those, either to supplement their income because they're, they're no longer working. And so there are questions that I had, and I've been speaking to colleagues, particularly in the US, around how particularly younger men may be engaging in that site if there is an issue around exploitation, how they're managing and looking after themselves in those spaces. So I think as we exit this or as we progress, that will be another area for us to start thinking about is the impact of OnlyFans. If I may uh, ask a question, uh, I, just maybe, but just uh, in terms of uh, OnlyFans, I think it's really interesting in terms of thinking about sex work and of, of course, you know, how that is often you know, on the front line of this very issue, like the, you know, the the bread and butter of sex workers. And so it makes sense to, to look at how, how, how they transition into, who are able to transition into to OnlyFans, for example. But actually I, my comment was for, well, uh, Schwal and Jamie, because uh, I saw like this connection, maybe you already talked about it, but excuse me, but Jamie talks about, you know, how our notions of intimacy, you know, uh, how Berland and Warner think about the privileging that operates through intimacy. And uh, of course, we should think about what kinds of uh, forms of intimacy are practicable in this time and who is that accessible for, you know, in terms of heteronormativity and the, and the family and the whole household and so forth. 
Um, and then I heard Schwao talk about, you know, the underground party scene and sex scene the, in Berlin happening out in the woods. Um, and as I heard it, he was connecting it to problems of care, you know, that there, you know, because you didn't have the right access to certain kinds of intimacy, and maybe you're denying yourself uh, certain kinds of intimacy, it kind of spilled over in the end into these like careless encounters. Um, could we also think about those uh, scenes as operating uh, with a narrative about care, you know, this scene of care, you know, these men are caring for each other and how the notions of care might make us blind uh, for the actual kind of damage that, that, that we do. Like there's a tension there that I would like you to maybe comment on if you, if you want to. Jim, you go. Yeah, okay. Um, so it seemed like, Christian, you were asking me about the kind of sorts of intimacies that are practicable. Um, and yes, I mean, I think that's a big question. And I think that um, that isn't just relevant to kind of gay men, but again, a kind of, if we think about this intersectionally, you know, who are you living with? Who, um, what, you know, what about queer youth who live with family? What about how much, how many bodies are in a particular space? How much access do you have to your own private room? I mean, there are lots of different ways of thinking. I mean, that, the household as being the way that we are going to manage the pandemic is very problematic. And there's been kind of decades of kind of feminist and queer critique that has unpacked something, you know, what is ostensibly quite an innocent seeming idea. It's, uh, it, it instantiates certain power relations and it excludes lots of people and there's a series of great feminist blogs on LSE website that talks about you know the household um so yeah I mean and and, and so I think that I, I agree you know this, completely with the spirit of what Joao was saying about um you know what this how that kind of structures the state's kind of pandemic uh, response and and I I don't and I, I I also agree that there is a tension I'm not sure how resolvable all these things are at this moment and I think everyone's raising really important critical questions, but I, I, I don't know what we do. I just think that often these things are not being discussed and said. Um, and I'm really grateful to all the people on the panel for all the things that they're kind of making people think in relation to, to intimacy um, and, and the kind of heteronormative structuring of it, which is still the common sense of most people in the media and most people in the state. So yeah, I haven't got anything more really to say to that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, on the question of um, um, the parties, uh, I think it's, I mean, I think there, there is, I think they are certainly driven by, by a desire that people have to, to be together. Um, but I think because of the ways in which perhaps no, no, alternatives were, were given as how to to do that in a way that you know involves some kind of either harm reduction or risk management I think what what's been happening particularly in, in the you know like all weekend long raves and sex parties in in I mean hasn't either in the, in the park uh, in in Berlin at least I think that there's an interesting thing in in I'm not sure if they are driven by care. I think they're certainly driven by hedonism, uh, which is not necessarily a bad, a bad thing, but I feel that the issue of, of, um, of care or reflections on, on, on ethics and care is currently quite absent from, from those parties. Uh, I'm thinking in, in, because also on the one hand, they are apparently, from what I... <laughs> I managed to gather there's a lot of corona denialists who, who attend those parties um, who either say it's either corona doesn't exist or corona is over uh, and, and that brings and then alongside them a lot of, of, of the club kids who, who haven't had clubs to go to recently which you know is obviously understandable um, but there is a, a secondary question around care as well, which which has you know it has triggered quite a lot of, of, of debate in, in in the scene here, which is around on the one hand, um, the club kids suddenly throwing these parties and sex parties in the woods where older German men were having you know used to go cruising, 
and suddenly can no longer do what they used to do because now it's packed with 20 and 30 year olds uh, raving all, my, all weekend long and leaving a lot of rubbish. So there is this sense in which an older generation of, of you know, as I saw someone call himself a person of the woods, uh, are being uh, having the woods taken away from them without without con consideration by this younger generation of mostly you know expats. Um, so the whole the whole thing is is quite interesting around you know how could something like this balance um, you know this desire to be together and to 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 feel together and to actually have sex together alongside. Um, conversations around how can we do this as, as you know, ethically uh, as possible uh, on everyone's behalf. And I don't think that has yet been, been addressed or, or, or solved because it's all happening spontaneously. There's no one really kind of organizing it. So I just also like to add something here. I think that partially because perhaps the way that we framed this, um, this event. Um, obviously we're thinking about gay men and gay men's behaviours but I think it's also important not to lose sight of the reason, particularly in the UK, I can't speak to Germany, why it's been such a disaster, right? It isn't because gay men are hooking up, it's because, you know, of a whole set of um, political decisions that have been made for the last 15 years that have, or longer, that have drastically and radically defunded our health and caring infrastructures and that have made it impossible for the NHS to deal with the outbreak. You know, as I understand it, there was kind of preparations for pandemic um, suggested like five or 10 years ago, and they were just completely ignored. So again, I say we frame this in a particular way, and I think it's important that we talk about gay men and gay men and sex, but this is happening in a much broader context, which I think is a much better explanation for the things that are going wrong in the UK, the disaster that has been the kind of handling of the UK pandemic which gay men are not responsible for. And I don't think anyone is saying that or thinking that, but I, 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 but I think we need to kind of bring that into focus whilst we're having this discussion. And I just want to just pick up on another point and it kind of links to what uh, Johnny, what John was saying, sorry, is about the kind of generational impact and difference as well. You know, I mean, I, Again, if you're a, a, a queer man in your 50s, you know, you may well have been feeling really isolated from life and from community already. You're already engaging and getting sex in a really, really different way. You may want less sex and you may want more intimacy. And COVID has certainly had that impact when I look around my own self and my own community, which are men in their 40s and 50s. You know, we weren't, we were already dealing with the ageism on Grinder before this happened. So thank you, John, for, for saying that. So how are we as older men negotiating this and the long-term mental health impact of, of, of all of this, as well as the kind of trauma and act trauma and tools and skills that we've taken from the 80s and 90s. You know, I, I, I spoke to a 30 year old recently and they were stressed out because this was, and I quote, my first pandemic and I'm not sure what to do. You know, I'm like, come on now. Um, so I think again, when we're, when we're looking around the interventions that we need to develop and we need to design and what our response is, we have to absolutely ensure that we're looking at what the outcomes have been for those of us who uh, I mean, I've said to people, you know, as a 50 year old positive black man, social isolation is nothing new to me, right? So what do I do when I come out of this? So I think for us as in this call, it's things we need to be thinking about. Um, I, I have something to, uh, oh, actually, oh, Ingrid, I saw your hand. Is that no, go, no, go ahead, no, go ahead, Charlie. Oh, sure. Okay. On you go. Um, so I, Mark, when you were saying, um, that it really struck me. I, I've been working with my team on a series of interviews with participants from our HIV self-testing randomized trial. And we've, we've found that the, this has mostly been with, uh, with cis gay men from uh, Black, Asian, and Latin American backgrounds. And we've found that the, the men sort of in the interviews, especially when we're talking about mental health, really describe lockdown as kind of this liminal stage where they're sort of in it and then at some point they'll come out of it and things will be kind of the same. So when they talk about their mental health concerns, they talk about how, oh, you know, normally I'm okay, but right, right now I'm not because of X, Y, and Z, lockdown, coronavirus. And with my public health hat on, like this 
this isn't a liminal stage. This is a long-term situation that we're going to have to deal with in various different ways. And the, the types of interventions, I think, that are starting to emerge, I don't think necessarily are recognizing that this, this is something that we'll have. At, you know, I think, you know, it's likely the earliest we'll have a, a vaccine, I think, would probably be uh, spring of next year. Uh, and looking to the long haul, how we support health in that time and mental health within that time and enable people to have strategies to have closer to the intimate lives that they want is really a huge question. And I think something that um, potentially there's not enough, uh, not, not enough focus on. Thanks, Charlie, and, and thanks to the panel. I, I think what I'm going to do is um, open this up to the audience a little bit more because uh, there's been some fascinating chat throughout the presentations and, and discussion. Um, if you, I, I'm going to try and, and manage this as best I can. Um, if you want to speak, can you send me a message? But I'm going to, um, someone called Mary has had their hand up for a while, and I'm just going to unmute you, Mary, and um see if you um want to speak i've lost you now mary does anyone else want to speak well i find mary again <laughs> oh no i found her um here we go mary do you want to hi sorry i didn't mean to leave my hand up <laughs> that's okay that's all right i'm gonna put you on your video so you can you can ask you go no, no, I, I don't have a question. It was you just don't have a question? I my hand to say I could hear earlier. I'm so sorry. Okay, no, that's fine. That's fine. Does anyone else who has a question want to, want to raise something? Don't everyone jump in at once. Because we'll just go back to the panel. <laughs> there is a question on chat now from chat. Okay, so... I'm oh I'm terrible at this. If my co-hosts want to jump in and and help me manage this because it's yeah, gone so smoothly, so oh so I'll read this out. I was wondering if you could comment on how Jamie's comments on the lack of physicality and community in lockdown steps can be a first step towards understanding the everyday of gay men in non-urban spaces. It's a really good point. In smaller UK cities, mm -hmm. those bars, parties, clubs, etc., may not even exist in normal times, which makes those exceptional impacts right. of pandemic times a normal circumstance for a lot of gay men out there. I mean, that's just a, that's a really interesting point. I mean, in the project we're looking at London and Edinburgh, um, we're going to start looking also uh, kind of rural areas in the east of Scotland. Um, but we haven't started collecting the data yet. So I think that's something that will come up then. I mean, I live in London and yeah, my, my, my normal is absolutely not the normal for most people in the UK. So I, I have nothing to say actually, apart from I think that's a really good point. And if anybody wants to, to comment on that, please, please do. It's an important point in as much as you don't have to go very far from large metropolitan areas for the, um, <clears throat> the nature of gay life and the nature of gay culture to be radically different. So you know, and e even within large metropolitan areas like London, there are really big differences between different areas of the city. I think if you layer onto that questions of class, if you layer onto that questions of generation, if you layer onto that questions of um, race and ethnicity, the picture is kind of a very complicated one and already was a very complicated one. There's a sense in which um, the kind of research that we collectively do, and I think we can all find ourselves complicit in this, is that we construct, not through design, but through accident, the idea, the idea of the ideal gay subject or the model gay person who is necessarily white, middle class, metropolitan and pretty young, and that isn't most of us. I mean, I must say that since I moved to Exeter for, for work, my, my experience of what gay life is about has become quite um, I mean, rural, I guess. Um, but, but then again, I, don't, I, I wouldn't know if, if, if a place like, like Exeter would, st being a university town and, and actually, you know, compared to a local, local other places in, in, in Devon would be, is, is actually much more urban if you want um but i'm not sure i'm not sure how 
I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I think it's, it's, it, it's, it will be complicated to also then generalize on, on what uh, gay life would be in rural, um, in rural areas. I mean, if we are continuing to, you know, make that almost like jumping or inside the metropolitan or rural, I think that there's something that, that gets also missed uh, in, in that straightforward comparison because again in my experience in Exeter in many ways has been very similar to to, to what I, I used to experience in London uh, and in some ways slightly different uh, I mean I think rural men still hook up and have sex and have 3G and all that <laughs> data you know? I'm gonna um... Mike has asked to a uh, question, if I can manage to. Okay, Mike, you are on, if you wanna. Um... Yes, thank you. Yeah, go thank ahead. Very much, Ingrid. <laughs> hi, <laughs> hi everyone, my name is Miguel Corral. I'm from Mexico and I'm studying uh, my doctorate in Latin American studies uh, related about uh, 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 med uh, queer medicalization is the title of my my research. So I have a question to to all of you because there's a lot of uh, interest in Mexico to implement uh, PrEP as an effective strategy to fight HIV, of course. But in always uh, activists and uh, uh, community-based organizations try to reinforce the idea that it, it is going to work or that Mexico is ready to implement PrEP because we see the examples in other countries as, for example, uh, Europe or uh, in, the, in the US. And, but, I, but my question um, particularly is that, well, in Mexico, PrEP delivered was suspended temporarily to those participating in the current protocol that is running right now because of the COVID-19 crisis. Did something like this happen in the UK or in other countries in Europe? Uh, because from my point of view, it shows that in, if countries have not demonstrated to have a strong health systems, PrEP is not gonna work as it should. For me, this argument is reinforced by the fact that we in Mexico have not been able to guarantee HIV treatment for people living with HIV. So thank you very much. Does anyone want to respond to that from the panel? Well, the answer is that in the UK, the, the, the PrEP impact trial what has been suspended, isn't it? No? No, it hasn't. No, no. no. That was a miscommunication. It was a hoax. Yeah. <gasps> oh my yeah, God. It was, it was a, yeah, it was a... False a, news? <laughs> something like that. <laughs> but we got in quickly and rectified it with a series of tweets and threads. So yeah. we got the info yeah. out there. Yeah. Um, no, I, I think, um, I believe the Discover trial was, uh, I believe people were uh, advised mm. not to necessarily continue on with their prep. And I suspect that that was, um, I suspect that that was an issue with personnel rather than, uh, rather than clinic necessarily. But for the impact trial, people could, can, could still access their prep. Most people who were ordering online didn't have, uh, didn't have issues. Uh, although I think about 5% of people uh, who were ordering online that we surveyed had some issues with shipments coming in from, from other countries in that the post was kind of messed up. But generally, I think our prep, um, our prep services have, have fared quite well in, in England. I, I can't speak to, uh, to Wales or Scotland. Um, thank you. I'm not... Thank you. Um, I'm not sure about Scotland, but um, which is terrible. Um, I think it continued. I, I don't know. I think I, I kind of buried my head in the sand for the first month, to be completely honest. So I'm not really sure what they were doing. But and I'm sure there are people on the call that can tell us. So I think um, I think. Don't maybe. don't worry, Ingrid. I I actually believe the false <laughs> the fake news. So. Um, I have a, a quick comment from someone who's asked if the panel, and then another question I'm going to go to, um, if the panel could recommend um, work around the moralizing of hookup culture that you've made reference to. So a lot of this has been talked about. If the panel could maybe put that in the chat box, that we've had some requests for some from references for that so people can can read around that. I think not all of us have 
have um, swallowed all the literature in, in the same way. So um, if people could share their references, that would be great. But I'm going to go to uh, Catherine Dodds to ask a question. He said she had one. So Catherine, have I asked? Yeah, okay. On you go, Catherine. Um, thanks to all. Those were really, um, really fantastic talks and have got me uh, thinking a lot because I think one of the threads through many of them uh, relate to the tension around what do we mean by health promotion? Um, you know, who is health promotion for? And what are the values that drive it? And, um, you know, for many of us, this is Groundhog Day, I'm sure. But um, uh, I think it's a really valid time to go back to opening up that discussion because I think we've been sliding certainly in the UK context for a very long time um, away from a, uh, a set of community driven norms uh, that people will describe as sex positive certainly about sort of taking men where men are at and you know sort of working with um, helping them find their definition of a better sex life um, and, uh, you know, and some of the discussion that's been going on in the chat before is, is about that tension between, you know, the larger, um, perhaps more corporate HIV organizations and what that represents and what their vision of health promotion is, um, as opposed to what we might call the rest. Um, but we see those tensions among people at large, right? It's not just about institutional stuff. So I do think that there's, um, Sorry, I just realized my mic was on my head. Um, I, <laughs> um, I do think that this is a moment then where we um, collectively um, put that back out there and put that in the foreground because that's really what's driving so many of, of your fantastic presentations today. Don't know if it's a question, sorry. <laughs> Comments are allowed. So, thank you, Catherine. Does anyone want to respond to that? No. Um, thumbs up. Um, any other questions from the audience, from the panel? Comments are welcome as well. It's, it's a bit awkward to have a discussion with me in control or other people in control, but uh, any other comments or concerns? Have we solved it then? <laughs> Do I pick on people now? <laughs> um, no, seriously, if I've missed anyone in the, in the, oh, Gavin, okay, right. Yeah, excellent. Let me try and um, unmute you and. Okay, I think you've done it. <laughs> okay, Should, can we see your video? Are you all right with turning that on? All right. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm just just following up and 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 taking the this discussion about sort of smaller cities and, and rural areas a bit further, um, because I think, I think while there's a, a more substantial risk to the infrastructures of gay life bouncing back, those you know, city like Leicester, three three gay venues all owned by the same business, um, that's really precarious. Um, but I also think, you know, precisely thinking through some of those um, platformed intimacies that Christian and others have been talking about, actually, you know, there's a new sense of connection as well as other disruptions and connections going on. So I think thinking quite carefully through the geographies of, of how pandemic is, is, is experienced across different locations is quite important. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I mean, just to uh, kind of repeat what I, what I said before, uh, Gavin, is that, yeah, we've designed the project precisely with that kind of thinking in mind, knowing that we're obviously going to get um, very different responses from people in London as we are from Edinburgh, which are obviously both kind of metropolitan in their own ways, kind of cities, and of course, the kind of rural kind of parts of the east of, east of Scotland. I mean, it's, it's absolutely central to the way that we've designed the project. And... Um, yeah, I mean, I, and I, I mean, I'm also just kind of in, perhaps interested to hear 
what people think about these kind of platforms intimacies because that's of course true but it's um you know christian is talking about a particular kind of subculture which exists in a purely mediated way um well i mean i don't know what they're doing offline but the way that that subculture exists is purely mediated and and again you know as i said before and i think everyone's kind of gestured towards this you know the digital has been not only essential in reconfiguring the kind of geography of of, of queer geography i mean you know absolutely kind of fundamental in lots of ways but this this idea that um actually let me frame this better as a question mark i'm very interested um what you said about the online uh that this there was a sex group that began to organize online things because i saw that might not with that group but another group that i think a more kind of commercial one and i wondered how that worked because as i said you know digital the digital and the physical are very rarely kind of separated in such absolute ways and it's not immediate to me immediately obvious to me how a sex club can be remediated uh you know successfully whatever that means so i just wondered if anyone had spoken to you about their experiences of that and you know what they missed and what they gained from kind of having a purely mediated sex club i think one of the issues was <clears throat> sorry was i mean it was, it was it was a zoom like this um, and I think that there are some initial technical issues, um, but it was, you know, cam to cam kind of activity that was taking place. And I think, you know, the couple of friends that I knew, and these were friends who attended, missed the, you know, cl clearly the physical intimacy of it. So it was, it was really cool and kind of quirky for the first one. But then after that, the kind of shine goes off. And so it's like, you know, and I think it goes back to what I think it was Christian was saying earlier, that if you are in a, a sexual network where that stuff is happening regularly, then I think, yes, one might engage in that more frequently. The guys have only done two of these online events um, and, and no more have taken place since then. That makes sense. I, I, can I do, Ingrid, I just want to make a quick point as well, just picking yeah. up on if we were talking about, you know, trying to ensure about, you know, people from rural areas, et cetera. But I think we can't have this conversation without also talking about the disproportionate impact of, of COVID on black and Asian communities um, and how that has played out in how men might be either protecting themselves, seeking intimacy, engaging with the world, or also might be being seen as, you know, vectors of infection as well. So are people drawing back from black men because of this, where are black men sitting in this in their relationship to sex and intimacy? And we, and we don't know that yet. Um, again, we know that <clears throat> many men from ethnic minority groups will engage in sexual networks with a similar ethnicity. So again, how do we unpick that stuff when, when that is happening as well? And I, and I think all of this is going to be really interesting stuff for us to do. I think the work that we've done uh, Prepster has been certainly to try to engage in those social and those sexual networks to ensure that people have that information so they can cascade it to friends within those groups because that broad pray and spray and pray approach does not reach my community. If I, if I may make a comment uh, to that, Mark, I think the whole kind of like speculation or maybe probably very real thing that you know some. Uh, uh, non-white people would like uh, move, uh, you know, move away from engaging with uh, black men in these times. I think that speaks to the discussion of that is brought up in the chats from um, is it Thomas Strong that talks about intimacy and whether or not that's a good concept to think with, you know. Um, and I think here, you know, thinking through the land uh, and Warner. It makes sense because intimacy is not just in their uh, uh, concept. It's not just something that we are, but it's something that is available unevenly to different people. And in this time, we are able to think about this. Then, like, what is the what subjects are able to be intimate? Intimate. Which subjects do are pushed out of the intimate sphere uh, from from in in terms of intersectional analysis, like like that. Like, and I think it makes sense to talk about intimacy and not sex in that regard. So I think it's a really useful term, but of course we need to be careful as Thomas notes that intimacy in the English language always talks, you know, it talks about care, like it's implicit that it's like a careful uh, mode, but in fact it is a, it is a 
way to separate uh, the, the, the good and the bad public, so to speak. But that was my, my comment. Okay. Thank you. Um, Alex, I'm, Alex, are you still okay? You wanted to make a comment? I'm gonna unmute you. So you're already on video. So go ahead, Alex. Hi everyone, can you hear me? Yeah. Great, yeah. thank you so much for all your amazing talks. It's been so, so interesting. It's been great. Um, I just wanted to say, I've been researching online sex parties as well during lockdown, but I should say um, it's not just for gay men. It's also kind of, it's more like queer people in general. So it's been quite a mix of like genders and sexualities who have been attending them. But um, yeah, I just wanted to note that the more recent ones I've been to, like say over the past weekend, um, I've seen much more like groups of people logging into them than I did at the beginning of lockdown where it was much more common for it to just be like one, maybe two, like a couple maybe. Um, yeah, so I just thought that was interesting to know. Obviously, I can't say for sure that it's people, you know, from different households, but I definitely got that sense. So I would say like the dynamic of this, those parties have really changed just in the very short kind of lockdown period, which has been interesting. And I wonder if that's similar for more maybe chemsex or parties that are going on just with gay men or bisexual men as well. I mean, I have, I, I would just say that I, I have attended some of those uh, and I, I mean, mostly but not 100% with, with gay men. There were, there were other, other people with other, um, I mean, certainly different gendered people in, in some of them. And I also noticed the same, the same um, transition from one or two people, which at times made it quite almost like poignant in a way when there's just one person who had not seen anyone the whole day and suddenly everyone's naked um, <laughs> to, to then in the, in, the, in the kind of later weeks, uh, certainly you know, five, six people in the same, even, even more in the same house. That was kind of interesting to see as well. I, I think for me that reflects how, given that gay men and qu queer people more broadly are likely to live in very different um, sort of housing and residential situations compared to, uh, you know, how we conceptualize as sort of a heterosexual household. And all, all of the guidance is really made based on that, that heterosexual unit with that as a focus and there not being enough consideration around the multiplicity, multiplicity of different ways that that we live and, and how we relate uh, and we we end up having to make up our own rules because the rules that are made by the government and sort of handed down in these in these grand edicts that are often contradictory and make no sense um, we, we just have to make our, our own decisions and decide what we're comfortable with even if it if it falls outside of the the confines of the law and I think it links back to a point that uh, that Catherine you made about um, public health versus, versus health promotion and I think a health promotion approach to this would take a much more rounded approach where we try to assess different circumstances and have strategies come up from from communities themselves but what we've had is a public health approach and I, I'm you know I'm a public health researcher public health is my bread and butter but we've had a public health approach where everything comes from the top down with very little nuance um, but also in a way that doesn't make sense like the rules don't necessarily fit with each other and so we end up in a situation where where nothing's nothing's really actionable and it's and it's not sustainable especially for for queer people and uh and gay and bisexual men thanks charlie um, i'm conscious of the time i don't know uh, there, there don't seem to be lots of people jumping up i'm happy to we can stay on we can stay on for a little bit longer if people want to um there have been some comments on the side about um the the focus of the panel being uk and european yep absolutely we we discussed um how we had uh, jamie and i had thought about how do we make it more inclusive how do we how do we broaden it out we came across um time zone challenges <laughs> um and also the the number of people i think we probably could have also invited lots of other, not to take away from our wonderful speakers, but we could have invited lots of other people to, to be part of the conversation. And we, we, we wanted this to kind of be the start of something or, or a, an initial discussion rather than a massive kind of multinational conversation. Also because in a way we were based in the UK and there's quite a lot of difference across this country. I'm sitting in Scotland where um, the response has been 
a little bit different to the, the UK, the English response. I wouldn't say that radically different, um, but, but, but somewhat different. So I guess there's also quite a lot of diversity within this context and it's about how do we how do we frame this and, and, and what comments do we want to make and thank you yes Wales and Northern Ireland and the the, the Republic of Ireland etc um, but that's just to say we could do this again um, that's not necessarily me volunteering to organize it but um, <laughs> but it, it could be something we continue doing um, are there any other comments that people want to say or or questions or concerns there was an interesting sorry ingrid there was someone asking about uh, a list or carrying on contacting uh or carrying on the the conversation as we say these days in times of, of covid teaching asynchronously um <laughs> via uh, some kind of mailing list uh, which I thought, I, I don't know if, if it's something you guys could follow on, but I think it would also be interesting, especially to, take, to think about the, um, another person earlier who asked about, about references or, or, you know, sharing a bibliography. Uh, yeah, or well, if I might add, from, from a personal perspective, I think Twitter works well for me. I know not everyone is using that, but that's a good way to keep keep up uh, like if someone if people want to if the organizers wants to collect those things and if people want to give those things i would be interested in looking at those things <laughs> we already follow you uh, <laughs> <laughs> very attentively <laughs> that's something that we can discuss in grid no yeah yeah no definitely i think there are things that we can do in the project so we will put the vid the video up on or the recording up on online um and uh, we can talk about kind of the people that signed up to this um maybe i'm not suggesting we create a community of pandemic intimacies webinar fans but i think we can we can explore options um thomas you've asked if there's a network already i think a number of people on the panel are organizing or or are planning to organize kind of conferences and things. So this is this is also where I think John and Joao, I think most definitely have, have got things underway or planning um, that kind of thing. So I, there's also a watch this space and people can advertise or, or share what they're doing. Um, I uh, have a bit alerted. Alvaro, did you want to say something? Yeah, let me unmute you. Okay, go ahead. Hi, uh, well, this question is for Mark, or maybe Charlie, the, you guys are more into public service. So I was, uh, I was thinking if you guys see the COVID pandemic as an, as an opportunity to imagine or to, to address issues with, with, with BAME or with... Uh, with, with Alvaro, Black sorry, can you, can you hold the microphone up? Ah, okay, sorry. Thanks. Uh, so, Okay, so I was wondering, um, well, one of the narratives that um, were very predominant when the COVID uh, began was like, there is a, a new possibility to imagine new futures, uh, to create new, uh, a, a new normal after, after this. So I was wondering if you guys are seeing this as opportunity to address um, inequalities for for populations that normally are not that don't benefit from from you know, from health access, so I see what you might do uh, have done, and I think it's, it's it's incredible because we don't have too much, you know, most of the um, most of most of the resources I think that are addressed are addressed to white gay men, but so I, I was thinking if you guys have seen this as an opportunity to change this. Or I don't know if I can, I'll articulate well the, the question. Okay. Does anyone want to? Go, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, Mark, do you want to? Um, yeah, I mean, you were asking about what interventions and we've done to get prep information and access to other people who aren't cis white men. It's exactly, but most of my what, what I want you to to tell is this. If you think this is an opportunity for for things to change, you know, if we can see that, uh, because we, we know that in England, for example, PrEP, uh, some population has less access to PrEP than others. Right? Mm. You guys, are working for that. Uh, 
to fix that. Mm. So do you think that this can create opportunities for you to change to change? to have a more equalitarian, you know, a distribution of resources between, between gay men? I mean, absolutely. I mean, I think that not only has COVID and the lockdown provided us an opportunity because it has once again shown, uh, shown, shone, a, shone a light on health inequalities. And I think the work that we were doing, you know, Charlie's done and we've all done around kind of prep access and information over the past couple of years has certainly shot, shown that there were health inequalities amongst gay men around access and information. And I think that COVID has done this. I think the other opportunity, and I use the word opportunity really, really loosely, is the Black Lives Matter movement. And the fact that we are all, well, I, many more of us, I should say, to phrase that properly, are more alert and aware to the, to the racial injustices which impact on health inequalities. So I think now is the time for us to grab that metal and say, right, how can we reshape that? And I think this is when we can go to our health service, the government, but also our NGOs and our national charities. And rather than just saying, put out statements, where is your real action? So we really have a great chance. And that is for black communities, for trans communities, for women, for young people. Um, all of those groups that sit outside of, I think, as somebody described, you know, metropolitan cis men in their 20s and 30s. So I think, yeah, this is this is a great opportunity. So, um, you know, scream Black Lives Matter, get out there and start shaking and shouting at people. I know I will be. Some more. So I, I have a counter. Oh, sorry. Go on, Charlie. No. Go on. Sorry. So I, I have a, a counter um, point. So I, I think it, it provides this situation provides us with, with some um, opportunities to address inequalities. And I'm really excited by the way that uh, that race is, is much more of a mainstream uh, conversation here and in my home country in Canada than it has been in a, in a really long time. Uh, what I, I, I'm generally an optimist and what I'm petrified of with uh, COVID and the lockdown is the emergence of new types of inequalities and re-entrenching of inequalities around wealth, around mental health and access to resources. I like, it's a situation that just makes my public health brain kind of tingle, but in a very bad way. Uh, because we really, we really don't know what this huge disruption in our life uh, will make and, and what shape things are going to be afterwards. And just having worked in sexual health for, for a number of years, seeing our services slowly collapse and get worse and have less access to them. I, there's talk now of moving most clinical, routine clinical services for sexual health completely online in England. And I think about people who access clinics for all sorts of different reasons, whether they've been sexually assaulted or they're going for their first test and they, they need some more information. And the reshaping of the way that we deliver services and the reshaping of our economy after this, I think it's so fraught with danger. And if we had a more competent government at the helm, I would be less concerned, but I, I am, I'm very concerned about the inequalities. Charlie, uh, actually, uh, it reminds me, is it, is it the case that is, or is it just de dependent on, on where, which kind of town or, or, or city we're talking about, but it's also my impression that even HIV services now are actually not, uh, I mean, postponing appointments, so, so people don't, don't come in in the UK, is that, is that the case? I mean, I, I would, I, I don't know for sure, but if I was a, if I was a clinician, I, and my patients with HIV were stable and had been for some time, then I probably, I would see the argument for, um, for postponing um, routine bloods for a bit of time and sending off, off meds. I think there, there's been discussion of now most people with HIV, and someone could correct me if I'm wrong, would go in for monitoring twice a year. And there's been discussion for some time of dropping that to, to every, uh, to once a year, but I, I could be completely wrong about that. Yes, I, I actually, on the, on the Black Lives Matter thing, the point that, that Mark raised, I also think it was quite interesting um, to go back to, to, the, to the parties in, in Berlin that they were happening simultaneously with the Black Lives Matter protests. And there was at some point a very strong sense of relief amongst the, the white middle class six-packed uh, gays in the park that, that they 
there had not been so much police stopping their fun because they were at the Black, Mar Black Lives Matter protest, which I think well, you know, was kind of particularly telling uh, of you know, <laughs> the decisions that were being made around raving or protesting. <laughs> Any other comments? I'd like to pick out, um, Gavin's made a comment that I think is maybe something for us to think about, but um, responding to, I think a number of the comments, Gavin said, how do we shift the political debate and campaigning away from the equalities agenda and towards addressing more material and systematic inequalities and their intersections? And I think if anyone has an answer to that, I'd be really happy to hear it. <laughs> um, uh, but I do think that we're dealing with some really big questions here and that um, I, I think one of the other comments and maybe it was John has said that, you know, the pandemic has just brought some of these issues to the to the surface or made them a bit more visible where they were they were already already happening. Um, does anyone have any other comments or questions? I'm conscious that we've been on the phone f uh, on Zoom for an hour and 45 minutes. Happy to keep going, but also um see people shifting around so i'm tempted to draw this to a close unless anyone has some burning questions that they want to share and don't just need treatment for does anyone have any um comments or questions no i don't see any apologies if i've missed you um uh, like we said, we will be uh, posting this on our website once we get the, the video through. Um, we will talk uh, in our team about maybe collating some of those resources that have been shared. Um, and I think there have been some really interesting um, uh, events that I think John and Joao have both shared in the chat about the, the events that they're planning and the networks that they are running. Um, this has been a really fascinating discussion. There have been so many issues raised. I'm really glad we've recorded this and don't have to remember it and keep it all in our heads, the, the joys of Zoom recording. Um, uh, just want to thank the panelists again for joining us. This has been, um, it's been really great to hear from a, a number of you. I'm sorry we couldn't give you longer to speak. I think we could have listened to each of you speak for quite a long time. Um, but um, are happy that you uh, were willing to join us. Thanks to James and Jamie for helping support me and my co-hosts for managing the technical issues. And thanks to everyone else for joining us. Um, I'm gonna end the meeting relatively soon. So if you'd like to put something in your chat in the chat, you can before you leave, but otherwise enjoy the rest of the day. Um, stay as safe as you can, but also have fun while you're doing it. Thanks, folks. Thank you all. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just going to end the meeting, guys. Mm -hmm. So, see you later.